Hello, everyone, and welcome to this technical session on maximizing your organization's impact with ArcGIS Story Maps. My name is Ross Donahue, and I'm part of Esri's Story Maps team. In this session, we'll begin by introducing you to the ArcGIS Story Maps platform and share useful storytelling techniques to consider as you craft your narrative. With that, I'll hand things over to the founder of Esri's Story Maps team. Alan Carroll. Hi, everyone. This is Alan Carroll. I head the uh, Story Maps editorial team at Esri. I think most of you have a basic familiarity with Story Maps, but just in case, I'm going to give the basics. It'll just take a few minutes. Story Maps reside on the web, of course, and they combine interactive maps that are hosted on Esri's cloud service, ArcGIS Online with multimedia content. So your photos and videos and sometimes audio and text, of course, to tell all sorts of stories about the world. And by that, I mean all stories from local um, scales like neighborhoods all the way up to continents and planet-spanning narratives on all sorts of topics from personal travel logs to corporate messages to nonprofit calls for action. They work on a variety of screen sizes. So in other words, they're responsive. We've worked hard to make the mobile experience work just as beautifully and smoothly as the uh, PC experience. And of course, they also work on tablets. It's best to author on large screens, but you can view them on any device. And they incorporate interactive builders. To me, this is kind of the secret sauce. So uh, you don't need to have any kind of specialized web development skills like JavaScript and CSS. Basically, if you can make a PowerPoint, you can make a story map. And the core of our builder function is what we call a block palette, which is what you see in the left panel here. So you can imagine these different elements, text and and images, video, audio, embeds, uh, and immersive sections as, as building blocks for your narratives. And so you can assemble those one by one and you can rejigger them, reassemble them to create a beautiful uh, multimedia story. Story maps are hosted by Esri in the cloud, again, on ArcGIS Online. That doesn't mean we claim any sort of ownership to your story. It's simply a place to park it, park your story uh, so you don't have to worry about maintaining a whole infrastructure. And from that, uh, that spot on ArcGIS Online, you can access stories uh, and use them and link to them in various ways. You can embed them in websites, etc. cetera. Uh, we started about a decade ago with what we now call our classic apps. So one by one, we developed these little web apps that uh, that presented uh, or that enabled multimedia storytelling <clears throat> within different kinds of user experiences, like side panels and and tours and things like that. They worked well and and they they became popular, but they had some drawbacks. Mainly, they were starting to look old, and each one of them was separate. Each one of them required a bit of a learning curve to uh, to master the uh, builder functions. So, about three years ago, we started working on what. Uh, what we now call ArcGIS Story Maps. It's got lots of advantages. The main one is that there's a single builder. You only have to learn one builder, and you can, within that builder function, within a single story, you can combine those different kinds of uh, user experiences into what we call immersive sections. We've also updated the updated the design, uh, we've made the um, mobile experience better, and we've worked really hard to make the builder process, the building editing process as uh, intuitive as possible. Story maps have grown really rapidly in popularity. It's been thrilling to witness uh, starting in 2012 with 120 stories. We're now well over a million and a half stories hosted on ArcGIS Online. And there are tens to hundreds of thousands of additional stories behind firewalls and within our enterprise systems that we can't count. Many organizations are using story maps. Uh, so things like uh, organizations like U.S. Um, uh, federal agencies, Environmental Protection Agency, and NOAA each have published uh, more than a thousand story maps. National Park Service, USGS, and many others, Department of Agriculture, etc. Also, um, many local and uh, state or provincial uh, agencies are publishing story maps. They've really taken off in the NGO and nonprofit realm. So lots of uh, conservation organizations like the Nature Conservancy are using story maps, as are humanitarian organizations. 
Um, they've, they're also being used by Smithsonian and my alma mater, where I worked for 27 years before coming to Esri at, uh, at National Geographic. Another thrilling development is that they've really taken off in the classroom. Uh, so teachers are using uh, story maps for, for instructional purposes. But what's really cool to us is when they uh, challenge their students, their classrooms to create story maps. So story maps are becoming a kind of gateway via which thousands of uh, young people are discovering the power of geography and uh, and and maps and storytelling. You can uh, you can find us at esri.com slash story maps where there's lots and lots of additional information. So please do visit us and please tell your stories. Thanks. Hello everyone. My name is Liz Todd and I'm on Esri Story Maps team. Here are some beginner storytelling techniques that will help you get started using ArcGIS story maps. When starting any storytelling project, it's important to consider who your audience is, what the purpose behind your story is, and why you're making your story for your audience. Your storytelling approach will differ depending on your audience. Are they subject matter experts who just wanna get straight into the weeds of your topic? Or is this concept entirely new to them? so you'll need to ease them in with just the basics. In addition, consider how you're going to distribute your story and what action you want your readers to take after reading it. Once you've figured this out, you're ready to jump into ArcGIS story maps. The best place to start is esri.com slash story maps. This is a great website to bookmark and explore the resources that Esri story maps team has developed. These range from community stories and what we're reading to resources like practical how-to blog posts that will help you on your storytelling journey. And it's also where you can launch the story builder and start creating. The flexible builder puts a multitude of storytelling tools at your fingertips, but there's no need to be overwhelmed. I'll start by showing you some of the fundamental components and workflows that will make familiarizing yourself with the tool a breeze. First up is the block palette. The block palette allows you to build your story piece by piece. You have text blocks, you can have media, videos, or audio blocks, and you have immersive blocks, which are used to create an engaging experience for your reader. Once you've added a text block, you can use the rich text editor, which appears when you highlight text to change the text style, color, and add hyperlinks. Once you've added a media content, you can use the media toolbar to change the size of your media. And you can use immersive blocks like slideshow to divert from the single column scrolling flow to create a more dynamic experience for your reader. Each block has its own unique format for how your text and media interact. And unlike media blocks, there are no sizing options. They lock into place and fill the entire browser window. You might have noticed a little gear icon floating in the toolbars for media blocks and throughout immersive blocks. This is how you access the options panel where you can make important decision about how your media is displayed on different screen sizes, add at asset attributions, or configure alternative text. Alternative text will appear if media can't load, and it also makes content accessible for those with assistive technologies like screen readers. Accessibility is an important aspect of any story, and we have a variety of resources on our website to help you learn the techniques for accessible storytelling. The design panel is where you can change your cover style and make adjustments to the visual language your narrative uses. Story preview lets you get an idea of how your story will configure to readers on different devices. And the more actions menu is where you can configure more granular story settings generate a printable PDF, or make a copy of your story 
And then of course, there's the publish button. It's important to know about your publishing options within Story Maps. You can keep your story private at an organizational level, or you can make your story public. And you can also share your story to a group. All right, these are some of the basic storytelling techniques for getting started with ArcGIS Story Maps. Hi all, this is Alan Carroll. Uh, I'm going to share a few of my favorite humanitarian story maps, and I'm going to have to go through them relatively quickly, so forgive the rapid scrolling. Uh, but uh, you can find this collection that I'm going to use, and I'm not going to show all the stories in the collection, but you can find this collection. But, um, you should be able to find it just by Googling ArcGIS story maps on humanitarian topics, and it'll take you right here. Uh, and along the way, I'm going to point out uh, a few reasons why I think these stories are effective. Uh, and in a couple of cases, I might criticize them a little bit. So let's just uh, jump right in. Uh, these are stories are by, by a variety of, uh, of humanitarian organizations. So this first one is by uh, Doctors Without Borders. It's called Left on the Streets, uh, 11,000 Refugees Face Eviction in Greece. The striking thing about this map to me, uh, since I'm kind of a cartographer, I said uh, about this map, about this story, is that it doesn't contain a single map. And yet it's a really, really effective story. And that's something uh, we don't necessarily brag about, that story maps work can work very well without maps. We do love maps and recommend their use, but uh, you can weave a very effective yarn without them. And as you can see, this story has done a wonderful job of, uh, of, of talking about real people. Uh, this is some, one of the things I love about story maps is that you can take advantage of the multimedia content, to the, 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 multi, the ability to display multimedia, to tell stories on various levels and to make an, a, a real kind of emotional impact. So here you're learning about real people and their, <clears throat> their plight of uh, being essentially stuck month after month in, uh, in Greece with, uh, with little to, to no, nothing to, uh, to do and nowhere to go uh, and fighting off a sense of, of hopelessness. And yet you, you, get a, you get a sense of the humanity of the people involved uh, while you learn about the broader situation. So a really, really effective story. Uh, not all organizations have access to excellent photography like this, but it's worth an effort to try to get really good images and videos to use in your stories. So let's move on to a very different story uh, called, as you can see, Ending an Ebola Outbreak in a Conflict Zone by the World Health Organization. Uh, this has pretty much everything. Uh, WHO has kind of pulled out all the stops here, and I think they've created a really beautiful narrative. It's got very high production values. It's got custom infographics, and they're, they're presented in a, in a consistent and attractive way. So it turns dry numbers into something that, uh, that, that really kind of draws you in. Uh, it also uses what we call map choreography to good effect. So first, it does a clever job of uh, locating uh, the area we're talking about in the Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo. And most Americans, it's important to remember, most people probably can't uh, locate DRC on a map. So this is an important element to keep in mind. But then it doesn't just introduce the, uh, that overall location. It zooms you into the areas of concern, uh, talks about them at greater length, combines images with them, uh, and then shows these uh, over 3,500 health structures in the area, giving you a sense of the scale of the, of the issues that, uh, that the organization is, is, is facing. Uh, I'm going to, uh, kind of, again, go quite a, kind of quickly through this, but in this case, they've used a, a uh, graphics library to create an interactive graph. So this, there's a good bit of sophistication in this story. I love how they uh, they created an infographic here that kind of unfolds. So I talked about map choreography. This is, I guess, this is graphic choreography that uh, that takes a, you know, presents a relatively complex topic, but but parses it into these different elements so that it becomes more accessible and understandable. And then here's a, a image choreography. Uh, this may be the only time or one of the few times I've seen this used, but it's really effective. So they take a health facility 
in the DRC, and they explain what the different uh, parts of this uh, this facility, uh, what their functions are, what their locations are. So it kind of marches you through the uh, a patient experience within this facility. So really, really beautifully done. Uh, if there was anything I could criticize here is that there's not a strong call to action. So one thing we really love to see story maps do, really almost any and every type of story map is to have some kind of call to action at the end. So there might've been a donate button here, or at least, uh, well, there is to learn more information about Ebola. Uh, so that there is a call to action, but I, I would, would have suggested that maybe they uh, they work a little harder at that and uh, and give people more to do because they, they're telling a, an important and inspiring story. If I'm inspired, uh, then I want to, uh, I want, I, I might want to do something. And so it's important to give people that opportunity. Uh, let's go on to the third example, which is COVID-19 and refugees. Uh, this is by uh, the UN Refugee Agency, and it's part of a series of stories. So that's another thing that's important to remember that you, stories can be effective on their own, but they can be even more effective as a, as a series that you can present. You know, you can parse topics up into into separate uh, pieces uh, to make the stories more digestible, uh, and you can link from one to the next. And of course, you can use the story collection, not unlike how I'm using this collection. To, uh, to present that whole series. I like the way it ends with, or starts rather with this, uh, with this video clip. Um, it also has a, uh, a nice unified look and feel. So they've used, they've used uh, graphics here. Uh, you'll notice that throughout the story, in fact, throughout the whole series, uh, they, the, the graphics have used the same color palette, the same type of graphic treatment. And I think details like that are really important. So I call it creating a little world. You really want to kind of unify the look and feel of your story and even kind of create an overall mood that might be, that might carry across, uh, not just within the visuals, but visuals and text as well, and perhaps even, even audio. Uh, just continue to, continuing to scroll. Here's another example of map choreography here. The, uh, the countries of the world are, are colored by whether their borders are closed or open. So the main story here is that uh, that um, COVID-19 has has compounded what was already, of course, a very difficult uh, situation with millions of refugees worldwide, with few choices to begin with, but even fewer given the the constraints and the problems of the uh, of the of the pandemic. Uh, this story is perhaps a little bit on the dry side, but th that's probably appropriate to the audience. So you're not seeing a lot of images that, uh, that tug at your heartstrings. But this story might have been aimed at policymakers more than, than the general public. That said, if we use this bookmark and go on to the discrimination section, it's kind of late in the story, but it does uh, suddenly you're seeing some, some very, uh, some quite powerful images that help uh, Point out the fact that uh, that that refugees with disabilities or other uh, in other particular situations can face even even greater challenges than the, than your average uh, refugee population. Okay, moving on again. I'm going to go on to number six here. Number four and five are just uh, continuing that series. Number six is uh, is a a kind of different example. So I've shown you uh, stories that, that are regional or even global in scope. Uh, I live and work in Washington, DC. And uh, so, uh, and in fact, I've, I've donated modestly to the Capital Area Food Bank, uh, but was thrilled to see this, this very effective uh, story map um, created by the food bank, talking about it, uh, essentially doing an annual report on hunger in the, in the DC, the greater DC area. Uh, we all know about uh, income inequality uh, and various other inequalities that, that kind of reflect that. Uh, and this, this story um, depicts that very vividly. One thing I like about this story is uh, it's clearly meant for a relatively general audience. So they've, they've defined things that, that um, people kind of in the community take for granted, but a lot of people aren't familiar with terms like food insecurity and food desert, et cetera. So that's a, that's a nice way to kind of introduce the story. This is another example of a story 
or an organization that's taken the time to create graphics, uh, special graphics for the story and, and have uh, managed to um, uh, create, again, a very consistent style and a consistent color palette uh, and use of graphics through the story. I also like these kind of colored um, tinted photographs that open uh, that introduce each section of the story. Another thing I often talk about is is providing a sense of rhythm to your story. And that's exactly what this does. So the titles, of course, uh, and the bookmarks delineate <clears throat> the sort of chapters in the story, but it's nice to have these sorts of uh, visual uh, cues as well that you're going from one section to the next. Uh, continuing to scroll quickly. Uh, I like this series of maps. This is a different kind of choreography. We're not panning and zooming around a map, but we're, we're seeing a, a series of related themes that, uh, that very graphically, very um, dramatically uh, point out the, the sort of stark east-west divide that typifies the Washington area. So uh, it, the western parts of the district tending overall to be more affluent, to have uh, lower uh, unemployment rates, uh, to have higher edu educational attainment, et cetera. So it's putting hunger in DC in, a, in an important context and giving, giving people a sense of, of what, the, what the larger challenges are. There's also a very effective use of our swipe tool. As I keep scrolling, we'll get there sooner or later. Uh, some of these stories, by the way, might be a little too long uh, it's awfully hard to uh, to keep these narratives short, but uh, even for a somewhat specialized audience, this may be asking a lot of uh, of readers to stick around this long. So, uh, it, it's possible, for instance, that this story might have been split up into several different narratives. At any rate, uh, it's very well done. And here's a here's a swipe showing um, showing uh, just to make sure I get it right. It's showing. Um, the effects of COVID-19 on food security in greater Washington. So, so here's pre-pandemic, here's during the pandemic. So uh, in a single or a pair of, uh, of interactive images or maps, you're, you're vividly depicting how much greater the challenge is to, uh, fighting hunger in the DC area uh, in the midst of a pandemic. Um, I'm a little surprised at the end of this to see that there, I don't believe there's any call to action at the end. There's a conclusion, but uh, I sure would have, and I'm sure the, uh, the development people in this organization might have lobbied for, uh, for a donate button at the end. Um, there, it, again, there is a link to resources, but I think, I think the stronger you can make that call to action, uh, the better off you are without, without truly hitting people over the head uh, mercilessly. <laughs> but at any rate, you get my point. I'm uh, going to move on now to a different kind of story map. Uh, and this one I don't need to dwell on for a long time, but it fills a really important function, which is a story map, a executive summary as a story map. So um, here are the uh, Sustainable Development Solutions Network, with whom we partnered, by the way, on a on, a, on our uh, 2020 storytelling with maps competition. They were just great to work with. But they've, of course, released their, their uh, sustainable development report. And it's probably, I, I don't know. I haven't, honestly, I haven't opened it, but uh, it's, it may be several hundred pages long. Uh, it's an important thing to do and it's an important resource to have, but most people don't have the time to plow through the whole detailed report. So it's story map is a perfect way to present an executive summary, uh, incorporating some key graphics, obviously short text, even tables to provide a quick overview and hopefully uh, attract people to the, uh, to the whole report and saying, this is really interesting. I wanna, I wanna delve uh, deeper into the report. So obviously here the, uh, the action is to uh, to go ahead and open that uh, open the report. They also, I think, highlight a, a partner organization. Okay, moving on. Uh, this is another uh, uh, Doctors Without Borders story. I'm not using the French pronunciation because you'd laugh at my my garbled or mangled French. Uh, but you know about this wonderful organization uh, and the incredible work they do. Um, 
Here uh, is a, a, another story with absolutely no map. And here I take a little bit of an is issue with that because again, most people don't know where smaller uh, third world countries are, especially Yemen. I would, I would be surprised if 10% of Americans could locate Yemen on a map. Um, so it wouldn't have hurt to have a small locator map of Yemen at the beginning of the story. Uh, just to help people kind of orient themselves. So something to please keep in mind. Otherwise, I love this story because again, it's, uh, it's, it's presenting real people so often. And you've heard about this phenomenon. Um, you know, we, we, we wring our hands, especially those of us who are professionally involved at the huge numbers of victims of warfare and of uh, displacement, et cetera. And yet, those numbers can make us, uh, it's just a human nature thing that they can make our eyes kind of glaze over when you hear about 500,000 people displaced or, or dying from a, from a pandemic, um, it becomes an abstraction. But, but when you see the, the real people who are involved, uh, both the, the, the patients uh, that are entering healthcare facilities, but security guards at those facilities, nurses, physicians telling their stories not just in images, of course, but text and, and audio clips, which I won't play, but uh, audio clips of, of their stories. It just drives home a, an issue and just makes it so much, so much more real and, and so much more emotionally impactful. Uh, this again, doesn't have much of a call to action. So that's a, 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 a mild criticism that I'm gonna, gonna return to and just a really important thing to keep in mind. Uh, let's move on to uh, uh, perhaps my one of my very favorites, which is called Working with a Blindfold. This again is by Doctors Without Borders. Congratulations to them for the wonderful storytelling that they're doing. Uh, this has a combination of, of the, the sort of emotional impact of people in the field with, uh, with the informational uh, punch that, uh, that maps uh, can provide. And uh, just, a, again, a really nice mix of those two. Now, this story happens to be about mapping. So the, the basic idea here is that there is a measles outbreak uh, in Central Africa. Uh, the relief workers who, who went to the area were essentially blindfolded because the maps, essentially no good maps existed. And so part, a basic part of the effort to serve this community and try to fight the uh, measles outbreak was to provide better mapping. So they recruited the, uh, the wonderful um, uh, open street map community and charged them with pouring over imagery to populate maps. Uh, so they've, uh, they've shown, uh, this, is, uh, this is kind of how the map, uh, how the area looked uh, on Google Maps, almost completely blank. Uh, and here's a series of sketch maps that were done by field workers. But meanwhile, again, remotely, uh, the um, OpenStreetMap community was, was mapping um, villages, road, road networks, et cetera, in much greater detail. So here's a, a nice animation showing a, a map being populated from very nearly blank to showing hundreds and hundreds of uh, structures and, and streets, et cetera. Uh, here's uh, an immersive section that we call Sidecar, of course, that uh, that presents uh, that tells the story in somewhat greater detail how th how they go from from these sketch maps and and individual contributions to a more uh, integrated uh, spatial resource that the uh, uh, that the uh, organization could use in the in the field. Uh, again, not a whole lot in terms of. Uh, of calls to action, but there are uh, links to uh, additional information about MSF activities in Chad and uh, about uh, missing maps, etc. That does it for my quick summary. Again, I uh, I urge you to uh, to to pour over these maps, these stories at greater length uh, on your own time. I also urge you please to share your humanitarian stories. This is, of course, the tip of the iceberg or an iceberg, perhaps a series of icebergs. And I'd love to see your examples uh, and your favorite stories um, on humanitarian topics that, uh, that use our, our medium to, uh, to good effect. Thank you very much.
Those of you who have made a story map realize, uh, I think, that there are two elements to effective storytelling. One is is learning the mechanics of our builder function and how story maps work. But the other is perhaps even more important, which is just creating an effective story, an effective narrative. We've looked at thousands of stories and created probably hundreds of our own. And over the years, we've come to uh, realize there are a few pointers that we think can, can help you along the way to uh, effective storytelling. And we distilled it from probably 9,000 down, uh, down to nine steps to great storytelling. So let's uh, run through them kind of quickly in the interest of time. Uh, so first I used to uh, tell people that you could create a story in, uh, in 20 minutes, which you can, but it's not gonna be a good story. So just realize ahead of time that this is gonna take an investment. It's gonna be an iterative process, but a fun creative process. So uh, once you're into it, uh, one thing to think about is to start with a bang. Um, you don't wanna just have a dull label style head, headline or title um, you'd like to, ideally, you can choose and, and come up with an evocative, uh, creative title that really lures people into the story. And better yet, if that title can work with the image that it goes with. In this case, it's a looping video of a, of a starry sky, which beautifully complements a, a nice evocative title. Here's another example that I think is really effective as, uh, and a way of starting with a bang. So instead of something saying something like the refugee plight that we're facing, et cetera, et cetera, it shows uh, this, this really lovely silhouetted image uh, that goes very nicely, <clears throat> both in terms of the topic, but also even the position of the title with the, uh, uh, with the, title, the title and the image, in other words, go really well together. Second is to think about adding a hero. By the way, not all of these pointers will apply to all of your stories, but where possible, thinking about adding a hero or heroes, I think is an important uh, thing to consider. So in other words, people love people. People love learning about people uh, more in many cases than a kind of abstract topic. So if you can draw people into your narrative or feature people as, uh, as kind of center points of your, your narrative, then I think you're better off. Um, an example here that of course of several heroes is a beautiful story that the Grand Canyon Trust did of uh, featuring tribal people and talking about their deep uh, cultural ties to, uh, to, the, to the Grand Canyon as essentially a sacred space. Your hero doesn't necessarily have to be a human being. I'm a birder, so perhaps I have a particular weakness for this, but this is a story that, uh, that beautifully focused on the life cycle and the, the amazing kind of migratory annual cycle of a semi-palmated sandpiper, a very modest looking bird that among other things flies for several days nonstop across huge stretches of ocean. The story is basically about the conservation of its stopover points along its migratory route, but by featuring a particular bird, you really kind of identify with the bird and its, its miraculous life history. Number three, give your story rhythm. Um, so often, if, you've, if your story has several sections, you might try to repeat that uh, a, a basic structure. So for instance, when I did a story on religious pilgrimages, I, tr I, I started each section with a big image, then a large map, then a longer text with a series of smaller images. And it's, it sets up a pattern that people quickly become comfortable with. Whether they're conscious of it or not, I'm not sure, but I think it works. Uh, we also did a story called Wealth Divides. And so we featured a half dozen US cities, but we for each one, we went through the same kind of sequence of map imagery, maps, photos, et cetera. Number four is create a little world. And by that, I mean, try to unify or tie together the, the sort of mood and editorial focus, but also the visuals of your story into a really unified whole. Sometimes that means getting rid of things rather than adding things. So in this case, uh, the authors of this story on Menhaden essentially got rid of the whole color palette, except for black and white and a, a single bright red. They eliminated most labels from maps, made their graphics very simple. And the, the result is something that I think is really effective and evocative. We did a similar sort of thing with a story on the two Koreas. In this case, we used two color schemes, one representing North Korea, the other South Korea, that we could use in infographics and in the maps themselves and a timeline, et cetera, to tie the story together. You can, of course, use uh, Esri's, uh, uh, I'm sorry, ArcGIS, on, uh, ArcGIS story maps um, builder function and uh, 
and theme builder to create a really unified look. So we've got, of course, these preset themes that with a single click, you can kind of uh, change the, the look and feel of your story. But with the theme builder, you can also get much more particular about choosing color palettes and, and choosing among hundreds and hundreds of different fonts to create just the kind of little world that, uh, that suits your story. Next, one size doesn't fit all. And by that, I mean literally screen sizes. So of course, our story maps are, are responsive and they work really well on a variety of screen sizes. But of course, the story will be affected by that screen size. Sometimes images will be cropped, things like that. Uh, fortunately, within the builder, there's a way to easily preview how your story is going to look at various screen sizes. And it's, uh, we, we recommend that you use that frequently in, during the building of your story and do things like adjust the focal point of images so they aren't cropped uh, if, uh, on, say, a mobile device. Next, think big, think small. And this time around, I'm not talking about screen size, but I'm talking literally about the elements of your story. So a, a story we did back in the era of the classic apps called The Cost of Beef um, talked about the environmental impacts of the beef industry. And we used uh, uh, world maps to, to give an overview. But of course, that kind of separates it from the everyday reality of things happening on the ground. So we also zoomed in on these industrial scale abattoirs and showed uh, quite dramatic images of feedlots to give a, a more visceral kind of local sense of the impact of, uh, of the beef industry. Um, so it's it's wise to think about using active and passive maps. And what I mean by that is that often we assume that every map needs to be interactive, but they don't. And in fact, a lot of people, a lot of casual readers don't bother to interact with maps. So often static maps are more effective uh, also in that they can show, you can include in, the, in that map only what you want your readers to know and not have them be distracted by additional uh, content that's irrelevant to the story. Our um, Express Map Builder is an easy way to do that. So you can, can uh, very easily and intuitively create relatively simple maps that show things like a series of points or a route or a, area, a set of areas. Uh, next, keep it short and sweet. So we all love our topics and it can be tempting to go on and on, but uh, the, the the internet can be a kind of attention deficits disorder sort of medium. People aren't used to sitting there for hours and hours reading your story. So it's best to uh, best to try to shorten your story as much as possible. This was a story that included something like a hundred different locations in the uh, former Glen Canyon before it was drowned by it, by the big dam. And that's just probably, uh, probably you're, you're probably gonna lose people if you have that many sections to your story. So a story we did on, uh, on spaceports, we could have featured a lot more spaceports, but we decided it's better to leave people hungering for more rather than overwhelming them with too much. So we just chose the spaceports that we thought were of the greatest significance. Um, finally, it's important to end your story with a call to action. So story maps are about inspiring people, informing them, uh, making them want more or want to do more. And so you don't want to leave them hanging. So it's important to at least have a link to additional information. Here's a really nice example from Protect Our Winters that gave a whole uh, series of different uh, uh, options for people to, uh, to follow through on. So uh, please do, uh, if you're inspiring people, please do lead them to, uh, to more and better things that they can do. That's basically it. We're gonna put the URL of this in the uh, chat window and we hope you can uh, perhaps uh, take some more time to read through the whole narrative. Thanks very much. Once you've got a handle on the basic storytelling techniques, there are so many other options to explore in ArcGIS Story Maps. In ArcGIS Story Maps, you can combine media for a more transportive experience. One of the reasons that multimedia storytelling is so popular is that combining photos and videos together with text makes content feel more real and more memorable to readers. You can use the image gallery block to create a collage of related images that help bring a place to life. And this is even more effective if your photos look consistent, but vary in level of detail and point of view. You can also add multiple images to a single stop in the map tour immersive. 
to really help readers get a sense of that location. Choose the media focus option of the guided layout if you want your visuals to take center stage. And don't be afraid to mix photos and videos together. Speaking of combining media, consider adding some audio into your story to engage an additional sense for your audience. In the narrative section of your story, you can upload audio clips directly from your files or embed content hosted on services like SoundCloud. These click to play clips are great for interview snippets, music or sounds that give greater context to the written text around them. In the Sidecar Immersive, you also have the ability to add background audio to any slide, which will play automatically as a reader scrolls through. This is perfect for ambient audio that helps evoke a stronger sense of place without competing too heavily with the text for your audience's attention. You can also add maps. You can combine map views too, using a trick that we call map choreography. In an immersive block like Sidecar or Slideshow, you can duplicate a web map or scene across multiple slides and then adjust the configuration of each. You can have individual layers turn on and off as the reader moves through the block, have the map pan or zoom to specific areas of interest, or both simultaneously. This technique lets you guide a reader through more complicated arrays of visual data letting them focus only on what they need to understand the immediate point before building on that knowledge in the next slide. You can also give your readers a more self-guided experience like this by using map actions in Sidecar. This approach is great when you anticipate some of your readers will want to dive into more specific aspects of the mapped data, but you don't wanna risk overwhelming your entire audience with too many details. These are some of the techniques that can help elevate your stories as you get more comfortable with ArcGIS story maps. This concludes our presentation on maximizing your organization's impact with ArcGIS story maps. If you enjoyed this presentation and want to learn more, we suggest visiting our website, esri.com storymaps to get started today. If you want to stay up to date on the latest story maps news, follow us on Twitter or Instagram, and be sure to check out our blog posts. Thanks so much for watching. We can't wait to see what you create.